today on CLC. How does judgment start in the house of God? When we don't have ears to hear, minds to perceive, eyes to see. And we outright reject Him. They saw, they saw that people only wanted Jesus to be the genie in the bottle, perform His miracles. But salvation, not for me, thank you. Take up my cross, not for me, thank you. I'm not going to suffer for you. Just give me the food. Now listen to these astounding words. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those would be who did not believe. He knew from the beginning when he was talking to the tens of thousands. He knew already who's not believing. He knew from the beginning. Matthew chapter 13 verse 18. If you've got your Bible, open it. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version on the screen. From verse 18. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation, trouble, or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he or she falls away or stumbles. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. We are going forward now. It's not just someone who receives the word. This is someone who hears the word. It's the difference between listening and hearing. This is someone who hears the word but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves to be unfruitful. The third soil is about perverted Christianity to such an extreme that many people, and I mean this, thousands upon thousands of people these days want nothing to do with Christianity because of the way it has been putrefied and misrepresented. Joel Alstein, thank you so much. Benny Hinn, thank you so much. Kenneth Copeland, thank you so much. And all the TBN, thank you so much. Including ministers, Christians. This is one of the reasons that society wants God out of their lives and Christians to be snuffed out. Notice verse 22. I want you to take notice of verse 22. It speaks about this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. I'm going to unpack that for you a bit, bit later on. I need you to follow me this morning, Christian leaders. Follow me very carefully because this is so important. The deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves to be unfruitful. Why is it? I'm going to tell you something right out, and it might be offensive. It is judgment. How do I know that? How do I know that it's judgment from Jesus Christ on the church to separate the true believers from the false believers? I need to remind you once again why I'm saying this is judgment? Because Jesus spoke in parables. Do you remember if you were here last week and the week before or the other week when I told you? Jesus spoke in parables and he said it plainly so that he conf can confound the wise and they will be judged, Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. And I'll read that through you, to you just now. You need to know. Before Luke chapter 8, Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4. Before that, Jesus went from town to town around the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum and all the places, raising the dead, healing the blind, causing demons to be taken out of people with such loud screams at His behest, at His command, out. And people would hear demons with their own ears screaming as they left the demon-possessed people freeing people from the bondage. I want to tell you, 
never in the history of Israel, never in the history of Israel, and I don't even think that thereafter, has Israel ever been freed of every single sickness than the three years that Jesus walked the earth and there was no sickness in Israel. Because he freed the prisoner. He healed the sick wherever he went. He heals seven lepers. But guess what? One comes back to worship him. Wherever he went, he proved that he is not just the son of man, but he is divine and he is God and he has the authority of God to tell someone, be healed and give someone the right to say, I forgive you. Made the claims that he was God. But it was the Pharisees who were the ones who saying to the people, no, no, this is not God. This is actually Satan. He's casting our demons by the power of Beelzebub. And you won't believe it. From that statement, go and check it out. When they made that statement, Jesus turned away from the religious. He turned his back on them. And the Bible tells us that he spoke to them in parables so that they will not understand. Because they indicted the Son of God. He had made clear to human beings that He is God. He has come to save the world. And they refused to believe on Him. Jesus performed all these miracles, not for the sake of a show, but for the sake of showing people that the kingdom of God, which was prophesied in the Old Testament, had now arrived. Matthew 4.17 tells us, From the time Jesus began to preach, what did He say? Repent, for the kingdom of God has arrived. This is why you will find in all three Gospels, Mark, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, that Jesus excludes the masses with parables. He excludes them. He speaks to the masses in parables so they will not understand. There will be those who outrightly reject the Gospel family. Listen to me. And they will reject the scriptures, even though the truth of God is in front of them. And I want to assure you, and I look at you, Haley, the evangelist, Kevin, all you guys, that when I preach to you, I want to reassure you one more time, I'm not looking at your faces and your hairdo and all that stuff. I see souls. I see souls. Because we will stand before the living God accountable for our idle words. And we will stand accountable before the living God for our rejection of the word. So judgment, I am telling you, is in the church. And if it wasn't in the church, do you not think for a moment that the church will be thriving so much so that the word of God would be forced out of these gates into the streets and into the workplaces that your heart is overflowing with Joy and truth and conviction. Is it? Something wrong. There's something wrong. Even with a parable such as the parable of the sower, even if I explained it fully to you and I opened the Greek Bible and, and made myself look clever, and one weren't able to grasp those simple English of Afrikaans woorden, Dan is jou oor toe, en jou oor is toe. Isaiah 6, to 9, 6, 9 to 10 tells us, You will indeed hear, but you will never understand. Jy sal hoor, maar jy sal nie verstaan nie. It's one thing to hear, and it's another thing to listen, am I right? You will indeed hear, but you won't listen. You will not understand. And you will see, but you will not perceive. You'll see with your eyes, but it won't sink into your head. It won't sink into your heart. So therefore, that's why I say always, the few are saved out of the majority. There's always going to be a few who will sit there, and we're not perfect human beings, family. We're not holier than thou. But there will be a few within each majority of each church throughout the world that will be sitting there, and they know that they are gods and they belong to him. And then there's those who will just play the Christian game. So out of the scores and scores of Christians in our world today, only 
And the Bible speaks about a remnant in the Old Testament, and it speaks about a remnant in the New Testament. How about Elijah going to God and saying, you know, God, things have got so bad, I'm the, I'm, I'm the, I'm the lost prophet left. In fact, Romans, Romans speaks about that. You know what God tells Elijah? He says, Elijah, don't worry. I have singled out for myself a remnant, 7,000 other prophets. Well, take 7,000 out of 10 billion. What's the percentage? Few. And I find this troublesome, church, as I look at you in your eyes. I find this very, very troublesome. And I find it very scary. Therefore, I need to remind you that it's that remnant. And my prayer is that you will be moved into that remnant this morning. If I go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm going to read it to you. It says this, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time that judgment starts in the house of God. Can I repeat that? Yet, if anyone of you suffers, let him rejoice. In fact, let me, I'm misquoting it. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God because it is time, Robert, Yuan, both Yuan's, that judgment will start in the house of God. Do you see that I did not make it up? I didn't make it up. The Bible says that. Jesus said that. How does judgment start in the house of God? When we don't have ears to hear, minds to perceive, eyes to see. And we outright reject Him. Luke 13, very important passage. He went on His way, Jesus, through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to Him, one of His disciples, this is what it says, Lord, will those who are saved only be a few? And he said, strive to enter the narrow gate. For many, I will tell you, will seek the wide gate and will, will seek the, try, to try and enter it. And they will not be able to. So even those few 12 disciples and the other few followers, it was a few. John 6 tells us that. I'll show you in John 6 just now. But even those few disciples who were following Jesus, and by the way, out of the twelve, Jesus and doubts the one in John 6 and says, one of you is a devil. You remember that? Who was that? Judas. So actually there's eleven disciples, not twelve, and some, another few, just following Jesus, because they're hungry for him. But those disciples look around at the thousand, I'm talking thousands, it's so much so that Jesus had no room to breathe, he had to get into a boat. And his disciples notice all this. And they ask him, Lord, out of all these, will only a few be saved? Why do they ask that? Because they saw the eyes. They saw the rejection. They saw that people were after free breakfast. They saw, they saw that people only wanted Jesus to be the genie in the bottle, perform his miracles. But salvation, not for me, thank you. Take up my cross, not for me, thank you. I'm not going to suffer for you. Just give me the food. But the ones who are following him, see this and they ask those who are saved are there only going to be a few and jesus just answers them you know what let me worry about that but you strive to enter the narrow gate and then he rhetorically answers and says many will seek it but they won't find it so they indicts the masses again church are you part of the masses don't answer please don't answer me this is a rhetorical question i don't want to shame you answer in your heart are you part of the masses or are you part of the few John 6, 60 to 69. Listen to this. I'm going to read it to you. When many of his disciples heard it, heard what? Jesus proclaiming the news. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this, at my word? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now listen to these astounding words. 
for Jesus knew from the beginning who those would be who did not believe and who it was who would also betray him. What did Judas betray him? Yes. But the Jews betrayed him. Therefore he indicts the Jews. And he says, This is why I told you that no one can come to, me un to come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Guess what? This is one of the most hurtful verses in the entire New Testament. It's heartbreaking. Listen to this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus turns to his own few disciples, those 11, well, including Judas, and he says, are you also going to leave me? Then Peter says the most astounding words. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? How can we leave you? To whom shall we go? You alone hold the words to eternal life. What you're saying is true to our hearts. You alone can get us to God. We won't forsake you. How can we? Peter said to him, amongst 12, 15, 20, 50, true believers, family, true believers will cling to Jesus no matter what. No matter what hardships come your way, no matter what the world throws, true believers will cling to Jesus with all their heart. How do we cling to Jesus like Karen and I were telling the old people? We cling to Jesus not always by ourselves, but man, oh man, we need each other. I need you. I need you. You need me. That's how we cling. Shane, I've had an accident. Help. I'll be there, but I'll pray with you. We do whatever. That's how we cling to Jesus. Because it's a body. We miss that family. We miss it because we think we cling to Jesus on our own strength. And I can be a Christian. I don't need the church. I can proclaim the gospel. You are self-deluded. You will not make it. You need to cling. So true believers will cling to Jesus. And if true believers are clinging to, to, to Jesus, then let the other people see that the Redeemer truly lives. And God is not dead. Only true, bo true born-again believers will take Jesus at his word where he says, you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. Only true born-again believers will lay aside their carnality. What does carnality mean? I can sleep around. I can have the party spirit. And by the way, I can even come to church with that party spirit. And please, guys, I'm not picking on you. This, uh, I didn't plan to say this to anyone. And the jawling around. That's carnality. And you think you can serve a Christ? You can serve two masters? Jesus says you can serve only one master. You'll either love the one and hate the other or devote yourself to the one and hate the other. Christianity, family, will cost you everything. It's going to cost you your popular, popular, popularity. It's going to cost you your and your friend circle. It's going to cost you. Yeah, it work, Yuan. Rob, it's going to cost you your friend circle. Kevin is going to cost you your friend circle. Salome, Marius, Carol, it's already costed you. I want to say that Jesus Christ owes you nothing, but you owe him everything. He has done it all. He has gone to the cross. He does not even need to answer your prayer. He might even see fit that through your suffering, His grace would be sufficient for you. He doesn't need to do anything for you. We need Him. We need to cling to Him. Because this world is temporary and it's passing away. We are, we are sojourners. Because we as Christians live by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Hebrews 11.1 1 verse 6, 
and 13 to 16. Hebrews 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who wants to draw near to God must believe in Him and that He exists, and He rewards those who seek Him. Jesus says, You seek Me, and you will find Me. Amos 5 reminds us, Seek Me so that you might live. So if you seek God, you are seeking Him with your heart, you will find Him, and He will reward you. Reward you with what? To be with Him. Not with money. Do you know that verse 13 goes on to speak about Old Testament people who clung to faith? And they didn't get to see what you and I see today. They didn't get to see Jesus actually come to the earth. But they clung to Him by faith that the book of Hebrews even tells us. These all died in faith. Who were they? Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Rahab the prostitute. All those Old Testament people, those prophets, heard about what God's going to do, but they died without seeing that God did it. But they clung to Him in faith, knowing that what He said would be true. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, they saw these promises of God from afar, and when that word says greeted, it's like saying hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. Your word be true. You are going to do it. So they greeted this stuff from afar, what God was going to do. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Not a homeland on earth, but a homeland in heaven. Hebrews chapter 11. So we can see from that scripture that as true born again believers, we, he, she, us, would place your trust in. In Christ alone and follow Christ alone and that's why I need to get to verse 22 and I'm gonna break it down into two sections two phrases for you the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches which choke the word so number one the cares of the world and number two the deceitfulness of riches I want to unpack this for you be sure to catch the second part of this sermon entitled the parable of the sower part 4b the seed among the thorns.